Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Betsy O'Hagan, and I am web and marketing for Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society, a chapter of the National Audubon Society that is based in the greater Cleveland, Ohio area. We like to say everything west of the Cuyahoga River from the southern shore of Lake Erie all the way down to, I think, Summit County, Medina, and that area. So welcome. Um, we host Guardians of Nature meetings twice a month, the third and fourth Thursdays of the month. If you can't make it, no problem. And of course, everyone's welcome. No problem because everything is recorded. And if you go to our YouTube channel, you can find the playlist there and watch all of them. <laughs> so let's proceed. Um, tonight's schedule, we are very happy to say that we have Patty Donnellan, Sustainability Coordinator for the Mayor's Office of Sustainability, who will talk about woody plants for birds. And then about 30 minutes later after Patty starts, we're going to work on projects. Now, if I may, I'm going to just quickly read Patty's uh, bio. So Patty grew up in Cleveland's western suburbs, exploring the woods, fields, and waterways near her home. Her love of the outdoors was enhanced by her parents, who taught and encouraged outdoor activities like fishing, camping, tree climbing, wildlife identification, composting, and gardening. Her love of living things led to many years as a veterinarian technician in education in wildlife and fishery science and a career as a professional naturalist. She is a certified interpretive guide from the National Association for Interpretation and Ohio Certified Volunteer Naturalist. Currently, Patty serves the community, as we said, as a sustainability coordinator for the city of Cleveland, leading rain barrel workshops, assisting with the K Cleveland tree plan, and helping guide residents to a more sustainable way of living. And with that, I am going to um, invite Patty to present. So if you can hang on just a minute, I'll send the invitation over to her, and then she can begin to share her screen. And then we will ask Patty to Take it away. Betsy, do you see it? We do. We're good. And if yeah. anyone has questions, uh, pop them in the chat, or I don't think probably Patty wouldn't mind if you unmuted yourself and just ask her uh, at a convenient time. Okay, and you can hear me okay as well? All, all cylinders. Super, all right, great. Well, hi everyone. Um, thank you so much for taking time out of this lovely summer evening to, to be with me. Um, so we could talk a little bit about some of our woody plant species here in Ohio. Um, now, if I start, my eyes start drifting my style is very kind of informal, and I haven't done a PowerPoint presentation in I don't know how long. So I'm kind of picturing all of you on that little bar at the top. I'm just, I'm sitting at my dining room table. So I'm just kind of picturing sitting around me right now. So if I start looking around, like, who is she looking at? I'm actually looking at all of you. <laughs> um, but like Betsy said, I do work for the city of Cleveland. I am here for you. I work for you. You are city residents. I am at your service. Um, but as we start to transition our lifestyles into more sustainable, um, healthy ways. That doesn't just include you know, ourselves and you know, what toothpaste we want to use, but it also, you know, we should incorporate the land that we live on and, and things that we can do in our yards to make things a little more sustainable, ecologically speaking. Oh, Betsy, the slides aren't advancing. Oh, there we go. All right, good. Um, so some of the species that, that just naturally do well, um, a couple of our trees, our oaks and our cherries, um, some of our shrubs like the beautiful service berry and the really cool spice bush, um, and then some of the vines that I'm sure we're all familiar with are, are wild grapes and our blackberries and raspberries. Um, and we'll, we'll get into a little bit about why these things are so important and maybe we should not ignore them or chop them down when they do pop up. 
So our oaks, you talk about a keystone genus of plants. It's your oaks. Um, they are so important to the health of our local ecosystems. Um, they're one of the largest groups of woody plants that we have here in Ohio as well. I mean, from everything from white oak and red and black and scarlet and pin and burr and like we just have so many species of oaks and they're just so vitally important um, to so many species. Um, they're host plants to hundreds, over 500 species of lepidopterans, um, are, which are our butterflies and moths. 500, over 500. That's not even getting into wasps and leafhoppers and aphids and beetles and all these other species that also rely on oaks. Um, so they're so critically important. Um, but think, I'll, I'll just plant that little seed, caterpillars. 500 species of lepidopteran species, the, the caterpillar stage. I'll, I'll jump to that in a minute. Um, but again, with the keystone species, you know, I love the quote from John Muir, when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. Um, and I found this fun little factoid today, um, the caption under the picture, a single blue jay can hide over 4,000 acorns in a mast year. A mast year is one of those years where you just get tons of acorns, um, and one blue jay can hide over 4,000 of them, and then only remembers about 25% of them. So right there, you have over 3,000 oak trees planted here in Northeast Ohio from one blue jay. So as somebody who works on the Cleveland tree, tree plan, I think I want to employ some blue jays to help achieve our 40% canopy goal. Um, talk a little bit about white oak. Um, if you want birds in your yard, and I'm talking to Western Cuyahoga Audubon, so you like birds, you want a white oak. Um, almost all of our species here that nest here raise their babies on caterpillars. Remember I mentioned that last slide? Um, if your oak tree has more than 500 species of caterpillars in it, you are just putting out the buffet for our native birds and helping those baby birds achieve their potential. Um, the white oaks are nice because they do produce acorns every year as opposed to like your red oak group that produce every other year. Um, and the acorns themselves are great for our bird species like our turkeys and quail and just so many other species. Like you run the acorns over in your driveway and you'll see bird species picking up those little pieces too. Um, and I wanted to mention just real quickly um, the Moses Cleveland oak trees. Um, there are have been walks at Lakeview Cemetery that feature Moses Cleveland trees. Um, unfortunately, they're reaching the end of their respective lives, um, but there are plans um, that we are trying to propagate some progeny of some of those genuine Cleveland pioneers um, so that the, the legacy of Moses Cleveland trees will live on. Patty, if I may interject just a moment, we have a question from Chris. Okay. How much space does a white oak need to grow and be healthy? Look at that picture. Your white oak can get big. They're long-lived trees, um, but they're just really your powerhouse. If you have the space for your oak tree, again, use that picture as your potential um, of how big that, that oak tree can get. So, you know, typically they can get upwards of 100 feet tall, and given in the you know, optimum condition, and almost that, that wide. So if you have a small yard, you know, those little quarter acre postage stamp yards that a lot of us have, um, white oak may not be your best bet, but let, we'll talk about some other species that can do well for you. All right, so you're probably, why am I so fixated on oaks? It's this guy's fault. This is Doug Talmy, professor of entomology, University of Maryland, fantastic guy. Um, I became acquainted with his work in 2007 when his book, Bringing Nature Home, came out. And it just really struck a chord with me. I'm like, wow, this guy gets it. So this is me being the total fangirl um, when he was here in the National Park a few years ago. I put 2018. I'm not sure if that was the right year or not. I just, I was so starstruck. But what a wonderful guy. And he just, he really gets it. And The Nature of Oaks is his latest publication, which... I'm still anxiously awaiting for my copy to arrive. And hopefully he'll sign that one like he signed by bringing nature home. Um, but he really, he drove a point home that I really wanted to um, 
I'm going to read this for you so I don't mess it up. Um, hundreds of species of Lepidoptera, again, the butterflies and moths, um, use oaks, and there's no other genus that comes close to that. The reason that's important is that caterpillars are transferring more energy from the plants to other animals than any other type of plant eater. Um, the oak leaf litter can last up to three years after it falls, um, and that provides a permanent cover, and that's exactly what all of those creatures that live in the soil, and there are more creatures under the soil than above the soil, um, that they need that protective blanket um, to maintain that moisture level, to return nutrients to the soil, and put that organic material back into the soil. So again, oak leaves are better than most other trees at, at providing that ecosystem service. So, thank you. Um, this little oak tree, um, I ran out um, with my ham sandwich today on my lunch break and took pictures in my yard. Um, this is a little example of I get oak trees that pop up in my yard, and I don't I don't plan my yard for oak trees, so I would just normally chop them down, them in cottonwoods. Um, this little one was growing right up next to my shed, smack right up next to it, and I. It was in a spot in my yard that I was kind of just not doing anything with the past few years. I'm like, well, I'll let it go, and I'll just you know, eventually cut it down or whatever. And I let it go for a few years, and this year, I was like, it's getting a little big. I think it's time to do something with that. And instead of just cutting it down, I opted to, to move it. Um, and then you can see kind of where I moved it to, kind of close to this little dead-end street. It's pretty quiet um, under the shade of a black locust. And... It seems to be doing pretty well. Um, so instead of just fighting against nature, I just chose to, all right, let's see what you do. And it seems to be well. So it did good leaf out. Um, this, this is today's picture. So it looks pretty good. Um, my advice, if you do have these little seedlings pop up in your yard and you're thinking about keeping it, move it while it's still small. The root ball on this was much larger than I and heavier than I had anticipated, <laughs> um, but we apparently we moved it successfully, so it looks pretty great. Um, but that's my advice: um, move it when it's small, and then it can establish itself, or put it into a pot until you're ready to um, get it where it needs to go. Because digging it out next to the side of the cement cinder block shed was a little more than difficult. But again, learn to work with what you're given here. Oh, our cherry species, love them. Um, another ecological powerhouse. They're host to more than 450 species of our lepidopterans. Um, and those are like the really show-stopping pretty ones, the tiger swallowtail and the red spotted purple and all kinds of just beautiful butterflies. Um, this is a good one if you want a, a, a native tree. It produces fruit and it grows pretty quick. Cherries for you. Um, it can put on a couple feet a year, so you, you get a, a pretty good return on investment for your cherry tree. Um, and I know it's, it begins producing fruit in 10 years. Like, I have to wait a decade? Compared to our oaks, which can take a couple decades to start producing acorns, at least you'll get some fruit production in your cherry tree you know, within 10 years. And even before it starts producing fruit, it's still acting as a productive host plant. Those caterpillars are still eating those leaves from the cherry even before it starts producing fruit. So I'll talk a little bit about a couple of our native shrubs, our service berry and our spice bush. Just love these two. Great, great plants to incorporate into your native landscape. Service berry are amelanchier species. Um, I'm sure we're all familiar with those awful Bradford pear, calorie pear, Cleveland pear, whatever you want to call them those awful white pears that stink so bad, this is what you want instead, your service berry. It's a great little, it could be trained into a tree. You can let it grow as a kind of a shrubby hedge. Um, and just everything about it is just wonderful. It produces this beautiful fall color, um, it, low maintenance, plant it and forget it. Okay, well don't forget it, you know, especially that first year, make sure it's well watered. Um, it does great as our street tree, um, in our tree lawns or devil strip or boulevard or whatever you call them. Um, it does great as a street tree. Um, it doesn't get big. It stays in kind of that ornamental size, so, you know, upwards of 15 to 20 feet. Um, and just everything about it is pretty. Um, 
again, being a native species, it supports our native pollinators, unlike those awful pear trees. Um, the berries on it, oh, you have to fight for them. Um, everything, all our fruit eaters eat, robins, keppers, wax wings, orioles, everybody loves the service berry berries, um, and rightly so. Um, I managed to get one last year. I had to fight the catbirds in my yard, for, I, but I got one. Oh, it was delicious. Um, but it's a really important species that, that the fruits are ripening as our birds are starting to migrate south. So this is a good little native, you know, healthier food um, alternative to some of the other things that are growing out there. I wanted to bring this up. Um, we have out of, I think there's eight or 10 species of service berries in North America. We have two of them here in Ohio. Um, those first two listed there, Downy and Smooth or Allegheny. Um, those are the ones that you can find locally here. Um, I mentioned Saskatoon service berry because it brings up one of those kind of ethical questions of native versus cultivar. You can find service berries through lots of different nurseries. And it, like, for example, there's one called Autumn Brilliance. Um, when you see a plant with a name in quotes, usually it's a single quote with a name like Autumn Brilliance, that tells you that it's a hybrid or a cultivar, so it's not a true straight native species. That brings up the ethical question and it's a personal choice. Um, like how much, and I hate the term, but how much of a purist do you want to be? Do you want to just kind of stick with your straight, you know, Amelanchia arborea? Or would some kind of a cultivar that's kind of bred to maybe stay a little shorter, that, that will work a little better in your landscape? Um, how do you define that line? Because even though Saskatoon service berry is native, to North America, it's not found here in Ohio, um, but it's still a native plant. So you're crossing it with, and usually any of the hybrids or cultivars are mixes of these three species. So it's like, it's still a cultivar, but it's still native. So again, that goes down to your personal choice of, of uh, what works for you and, and what's available and, and how you feel about you, know, whether it's a straight native or a cultivar. I'll leave it at that. Oh, spice bush. Gosh, you go around our local parks and you'll see spice bush. Oh, it's so, it's such a wonderful plant. You'll see it growing along the edges of trails, um, fighting for competition with the invasive bush honeysuckle. Um, but this one does so well here um, in a wide range of, of light conditions and soil conditions. Um, it gets a little big, so if you want to put it right in front of your house, you know, keep that in mind that you'll have to keep it trimmed. But it handles trimming well. You can, you know, prune about a third of it down every year or every other year um, to keep it in the form that, that you like. Um, it's tough, tolerant. Um, there's really no diseases that it harbors. Um, you know, like our, I'm looking at a, a, a native viburnum in my yard out here, and it's getting decimated by viburnum leaf beetles. This is pretty tough. We haven't found any pests or d diseases that really affect spice bush. Um, and going back to the non-native bush honeysuckle compared to the spice bush, you really can't go wrong with spice bush. Um, the berries ripen at the same time, but the bush honeysuckle is so nutritionally deficient. Let me put it this way. All right, let's all say we're going to walk to Florida um, and let's just do it by eating candy bars. Initially, it sounds like a great idea, um, but think about how unhealthy, how nutritionally deficient you'll be when you arrive in Florida. Um, that's kind of what the, the, the bush honeysuckle is to our migrating birds, as opposed to spice bush, um, which is so much more of a healthier option. Um, and even like in the texture of the berries, when you touch the honeysuckle, it's a very juicy little thing. It's just sugar and water. Um, as opposed to the spice bush berry, it's got some heft to it. You know, it's, it's kind of, it's dry and mealy, but it's just packed with proteins and good fats and all that stuff that those birds really need to help build that muscle so they can power their flight south. So.
our vines. We're all familiar with these. Remember when Northeast Ohio was nothing but woods and we'd go and play and swing on the grapes and bounce on them and all that. Um, our vines really just check off so many boxes for our, for our birds. They provide food, grapes and blackberries. Who doesn't love those, right? Um, they provide shelter. Think about that little tangle of brambles. Um, that's good shelter, which also provides a very safe place to raise baby birds. Um, and a neat little uh, fact I learned today, the, uh, the grapevines, how they go way to the tops of trees, it's been shown that those vines act as like little interstates you know, through the forest. Black-capped chickadees, blue-gray gnat catchers, brown creepers will use those vines as little roadways, um, which I just thought was just so cool. So our wild grapes, uh, another picture I took today in my yard. Um, on this side, I have an acre of land and it's almost all grass. Um, so I was trying to create this beautiful little garden on the front of side of this fence. Nothing lived. Um, it, it's too sunny and too wet and it's just r ridiculous. And everything I planted in there died. Um, I managed to rescue one plant and moved it to a new location and it's just, I can see it from here, it's just going crazy back where it is. But in this spot, nothing lived, and except for this little grapevine that popped up, um, was it last year or year before? I'm like, I, great, super, I got something growing here. Um, so I just decided to let it be and I'm going to see what it does and hopefully it doesn't damage the fence too much. Um, but our grapes are so important. Um, they feed so many species of our birds, from as big as turkeys down to little chickadees, um, and makes up a, a very large component of our terrestrial bird's diet, too. Um, again, the sturdy stems provide good nesting, the, you know, how the bark peels on it, um, which is used to line or construct a lot of birds' nests. Um, yeah, and six species in Ohio. We don't have all six here in Northeast Ohio, and I'm not going to get into the colloquial common names, but we have a couple here and they're just all wild grapes to me, um, which are all native. Um, there is something kind of similar looking called porcelain berry. Ooh, that's starting to become a big problem. And if you've ever been to Wendy Park, you'll see a lot of porcelain berry there. Um, it's pretty and it gets these really interesting blue berries on it, um, but it's, it's kind of displacing our, our native vine species, which are much more valuable to our to our native birds. Excuse me, Patty. Chris, Go ahead. Um, Chris, would you like to unmute yourself and ask? Sure, uh, Patty. Uh, what's your are crab apple trees beneficial for birds? They are. Uh, yeah, the malice species crab apples are actually a very nice choice, um, and it, that's a great specimen tree, like your service bear, it stays small, gets real pretty, um, mm -hmm. provides a great nutritious uh, food source. Yeah, okay. yeah, apples are wonderful. Thank you. All right, so and last but not least, blackberries and black raspberries, and just a quick, di oh, that disappeared awful quick, um, quick differentiation, both of these popped up in my yard, and I wasn't quite sure which was which. Um, but it's pretty easy to, to distinguish which one. Blackberries on the left. Um, the stem is almost kind of squarish. You can see those kind of ridges on it, and the thorns are a little more substantial. And black raspberries on the right. Um, that's a young cane that's kind of that greenish color. Um, and if you touch it, it's got like that white blockus bloom on it that kind of white off. It kind of reveals a brighter color there. Um, so that's a quick way to tell those apart. Um, and again, they pop up everywhere. I'm sure we're all familiar. I'm sure we've all been scratched <laughs> by these two. But again, another really super important source of food. And these are good because, sorry, I live on a really busy street here, so pardon all the, the traffic here. Um, but they, they fruit at different times. Black raspberries are a little bit earlier in the summer and black, true blackberries are in your later summer going into fall. So there's a, a nice, fruit food source available, especially for like our wax wings and Orioles, um, our, our fruit eaters. Um, these are really important species for them. Um, 
this is a black raspberry that popped up in my yard and just a, again a quick differentiation you flip the leaf over black raspberry is almost silver on the underneath and then you see that stem that's kind of like pointing to one o'clock that's um, a second year cane of it it gets a beautiful purpley color to it um, so I will leave you with this final thought um, these plants most of these plants um, came up by the actions of some sort of wildlife. Some species deposited a seed or planted an acorn in my yard. I, I'm, I'm trying to get away from this kind of vision, like I'm going to put this garden here and have these species here, and this is going to be my full sun pollinator garden. I'm going to have these species. I'm going to do this here. What do they say about the best laid plans? Um, so I'm, I'm learning to accept these little gifts that nature's giving me and learning how to incorporate them into my landscape because obviously you know a wildlife species brought it here it's going to benefit wildlife um so yeah so just learn how to work with nature and in, instead of fighting against it um, oh, need to advance Okay, oh, and a quick plug for tomorrow. Um, if you have not attended one of uh, Ohio State University's webinars, they have really stepped up this past year to pro provide some really great educational content. Um, and as of four o'clock this afternoon, registration was still open, um, but there's a great talk tomorrow morning at 10 um, about blue jays and oaks. Um, so maybe you can go into that with you know, a little bit of that little factoid of 4,500 acorns. Um, but Betsy will drop those links in the chat for you um, if you're interested in attending. Um, that second little bullet there that says Cleveland Metro Parks, that's an extremely helpful guide that, that the Metro Parks has provided, and it's landscaping for biodiversity. So if you're looking to put some species that are really beneficial, use this guide. Um, the way I've learned to use it, you know, it, it's broken down by trees and shrubs and, you know, flowering plants, all that. Um, so, like, I want to put a shrub in my yard. Go to that certain page, go under the shrub category. There's a column on the far right called COC. It's a bunch of $2 words, coefficient of conservatism. I call it the pickiness scale. The lower that number is, the less picky it is. Great. And all the species listed in this guide are all native to Ohio. So I'm learning to use that, you know, get out of this mindset, I'm going to have these species and this is how my garden is going to look and learn to use the resources. Like, all right, I want a shrub that gets about this high and it's got a, a low number, super. You know, if you pick something with like an eight, nine or 10, that's a very specific habitat that you have to try to maintain for that species. So the lower the number, the easier it is to handle. Um, the last one is just, a, a, if you want to follow along with my garden bumbling, um, you can go to sustainablecleveland.org and look up one of my latest blogs um, about gardening season. Um, and I want to leave you with one of my most favorite quotes. Um, In the end, we'll conserve only what we love. We'll love only what we understand, and we'll only understand what we are taught. Um, again, learn to accept these little gifts that, that nature gives you, um, and you will be rewarded beyond measure. Um, there's my contact information. Shoot me an email. I'd love to talk more about this, um, these plant and animal interactions and things you can do to help make our world a little more sustainable. I'd love to chat with you. Hit me up at pdonald.ohio.gov. Um, I have my phone number, but I'm still kind of working remotely for the most part. Um, we'll, that will be changing soon. But, uh, yeah, give me a call, too. Um, and be well and be at least a little wild. And I thank you for your time. Patty, I have a question for you. This is Gloria Ferris. Hi, um, Gloria. Hi. I live in Cleveland, and I signed up to get a tree lawn tree because mine was destroyed when it is, was planted a few years ago. Yeah. Is, can I, when they finally get to me, I mean, they told me to be patient, but am I able to say I like a service berry or a crab apple tree or no? Do I just get what they're Unfortunately, what giving me? 
The people that are in charge of the planting um, are a little reluctant to suggestions. Um, and, oh. and they are using a couple non-native species, but without the potential of them being invasive. Um, but yeah. Well, I will not let them put a pear tree on oh, my... Oh, yeah, definitely on. no. No pear trees will be used, and I, I wish oh. I could remember. Um, okay, good. I think when you get contacted, <laughs> let them know. Like, I don't, just at least I don't want a non-native tree. This is what I'm thinking. And maybe, you know, they can work with you to maybe give you a credit so that you can purchase one on your own. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a lot of pull with on the Cleveland tree plan. I'm kind of one of the, the the grunt workers. I'm going out and surveying the streets and, you know, looking for power lines. and like, yeah. Yeah. So, um, but it, when you do get contacted, let them know your concerns. It seems in my opinion, it seems so odd that the director of sustainability would not be on the ground floor of helping to choose the trees to plant on the tree lawn. I, I, it, I agree. It, it I, makes no sense to me. <laughs> but that's my opinion. So We are kind of scrambling. Mayor Jackson made a very ambitious goal that um, – we don't have a lot of nurseries in this area that can provide 100% native trees that will fit the bill. So, yeah, yeah we're all kind of crunched here, and we understand the, the need to meet this goal, why we need to meet this goal. But, yeah, it's I, I wish we could do it a, a straight native plant. Did, you, he, did I hear you say that I could... Uh, suggest that I would buy the service berry tree or the crab apple tree, and they could give me or give me credit for that or or something. I, yeah, I. Uh, You're not you sure. Can, I'm not sure. It it that's the division of of urban. But I can ask. But you can. It doesn't hurt. Okay. To ask. All yeah. right. Thank you. This was yeah. very informative and oh, so great. You. So just in our wheelhouse, everybody. I mean, it's, it's just great. Thanks so much. Thank you, Gloria. Thank, thank you, Patty. Um, thanks so much. Any other last-minute questions before Patty? And Patty, you're welcome to stay on or or not. Um, whatever. Oh, I'd like to stay on. Yeah, if you don't mind having me. I'll no, mute. not at all. <laughs> all right, all right. We'll move on. Hang on a second. All right. All right. Let's move on. Um, now, let's see. Uh, um, the next, this slide is where we left off. The next one, I want to um, just briefly um, tell you that next Thursday, uh, hang on a second here, uh, Tammy Fierro Zeiss, uh, who is Audubon, Washington, and Audubon, Miami Valley. She's, she'll be uh, talking to us from the West Coast, opens with a personal climate disaster experience. Now, I know after we've been talking about springtime and growing things and planting things and, and all of this, this uh, you may think, yeah, that's kind of, I don't know about that. But I think that it's a conversation that we really need to have. Uh, I remember chatting with uh, Tammy when she was in the process of moving from Ohio to the West Coast last summer during those uh, uh, tragic forest fires. And uh, she had such an unbelievable experience. Uh, and so she's going to come and tell us her story. Uh, she views life completely differently after having that experience. So she's going to talk about life after personal impacts of increasing climate disasters and basically saying uh, sort of she traveled 2,000 miles to resettle in Oregon, uh, and uh, she went firsthand through the effects of uh, those climate disasters uh, last summer. And she has thought an awful lot about her experience and what she really feels uh, people need to think about and know um, since many of us will be experiencing more and more of these climate disasters. So um, I hope you come back next week for Guardians and we'll meet Tammy and hear a little bit from her. 
Uh, we did that. Um, all right. Now I'm going to, uh, we'll go on and look, I thought we would um, just talk for two seconds about some of the things that have been launched and gone on uh, that we talked about last month. So last month we were talking about the artwork uh, donation project that Sean Missig put together, some beautiful poetry and nature photography that he does. Uh, and he put it into uh, uh, like 450 uh, uh, prints of this artwork. Uh, and um, there are four different, it's a collection of, in a collection of four, five, I think, five different um, pieces uh, based on the seasons. Uh, that has uh, been published to the store and it is a fundraiser. So WCAS benefits from the proceeds from that artwork. So do go to the uh, WCAS store and take a look and check it out. Um, the next, the other thing that we talked about and we're working on last month that has come to fruition as well is the spring membership campaign. So that is launched and on the way. Uh, you may have received, if you've subscribed to WCAS newsletters and communications, you've gotten stories about that. Uh, and I hope that you will um, become a member. Uh, and we actually have a raffle going if we can make our goal of, we'd like to make a goal of 25 new members. Uh, the uh, membership ends June 20th, just before the first day of summer. And there is a raffle associated with that. Uh, we, we have some really, really cool prizes. So. It's, um, do try to take a look at it and become a member. It's awesome. All right, tips. Um, when you're talking, this is uh, with regard to a couple of reminders. Um, just provide a quick update on your project uh, if you're here to talk about it. And um, talk if you like, you know, about your successes and challenges. And then um, do think that, you know, you're sharing with this group. And anyone who's here, we always say the party is whoever shows up. So uh, ask the collective, ask the community uh, in relation to your project, if it applies, what, uh, what you need. Uh, and also, what do you want? What do you need? Uh, do you need more volunteers? Do you need materials? Do you need to uh, help raising funds to get some an, a, a component of your project? And here we work on projects that ultimately uh, provide free services to the public uh, and or are themselves fundraising projects. Uh, offer constructive feedback. Uh, get uh, contact information. I try to list it. If it's not listed, I'm happy to send it to you. And follow up with people. Like we say, knit the network. So we want to keep connections, keep building the connectivity so that we can grow this social network that works on cool projects. Uh, report progress to the group if you're able to at the next meetup. And please think about inviting a friend. Help us again grow the network. Uh, here are our projects list. And we can begin with that. Uh, if you like, you're per will, welcome to unmute yourself. And um, so the first one, these are not in any particular order. So. If anyone needs to leave or would like to uh, say something and then scoot out, no problem. Just uh, let me know in the chat or unmute yourself and speak up. Maybe me. Okay, very good. Thank you, Karu. Hi, uh, thank you, Donnell, for uh, your presentation. Uh, I need to uh, listen to it one more time uh, on YouTube, but uh, yeah, it was so helpful. Thank you. So uh, I'm a call Rutsubani from a bird friendly uh, native plant sales. And uh, uh, so uh, we, we sell, we are selling native plants, five species of native plants each month. And uh, uh, this month uh, our sales are done and uh, we are going to deliver native plants to uh, customers tomorrow, uh, we are having uh, those native plants from Nutting Onion Nursery in Columbia Road. 
Yeah, uh, in April we sold out and uh, uh, this month uh, we didn't uh, sell out, but uh, yeah, still I think it's okay. Uh, people could uh, have uh, many native plants and uh, uh, our profit will go to other projects too. So this is my project and so if you can have uh, any idea like uh, we can sell this place or something like that, uh, that would be great. For now, uh, we don't have a farmer's market or a place to sell. That's why we uh, keep, we keep selling online. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Karu. Any questions, anyone? Hey, Betsy, um, why don't you help uh, did you put up the soil that we're now selling in addition to the native plants? Maybe talk about the store and how you can go to get the soil and the native plants. And uh, Karu, will we be selling the remainder of maize plants in June or are we done? Do they go back to best? We are we are done because uh, uh, we are buying those plants uh, in consignment, and uh, also Nodding Onion have a sales place. In uh, uh, they are selling in Frostville, so I don't oh. wanna, you know let her keep uh, like native plants for us because we don't know who can buy them. So that's why uh, I stick with five species, and okay. each species will have five, so 25 numbers total. So yeah, this is uh, how it works. So next okay. month we will have uh, another five species. I get that. Thanks. Thanks. That clarifies something for me. Thank you. Thanks, Kuro. All right, I've posted the links to the soil and the native plants in the chat. Um, anything else on, on plants? Okay, uh, let's move on. Uh, Dorina, would you like to give a couple updates on the book club? Sure, sure. Thank you. Well, hello, everybody. And I think I see some faces I'm not familiar with, so I'd like to say hello if I haven't met you before. And um, the inaugural book club meeting um, started in 20, uh, 2020 by Gloria and Betsy, um, had six uh, offerings this past year, monthly offerings, with an author speaking and then also a follow-up uh, meeting just to discuss books that people love and enjoy. And after this first year, we have looked at uh, where the book club might go in terms of uh, reaching out to more people and offering uh, perhaps a more convenient schedule and also trying to reach out and um, have more people attend. I was excited to hear Patty talking tonight about another book, her, uh, yeah. the person that she um, so admires and uh, I got excited about that book. <laughs> so, um, so last week, um, in we had a small group meeting, and we were able to make uh, some good progress in some of our planning. And part of what we discussed was to have a um, survey to send out to get a better sense of what people may need and like, and. Uh, and actually through our discussion, uh, Gloria came up with some uh, key points. So I think what I'd like to ask tonight for those of you who are familiar with that meeting, uh, to ask, to say to you, um, do you have a sense that the survey is a good idea and we should go ahead with it? Gloria says yes. If, if anybody else is familiar with it, okay. Um, Lisa Rupel, who's a new member of the uh, book club, put together a survey. So it, it looks like it's probably in pretty good shape and ready to go. Um, 
So um, I think that's about it for now. Oh, one other thing I just want to say, kind of, it was really a great idea that was suggested to have a uh, children's or a family um, time set, set aside for children and family. And I thought that was really a, a really good idea in terms of perhaps including um, intergenerational activities and, you know, perhaps, you know, we might have a budding um, naturalist come out of these this children's presentation and discussion of, about a book. So I thought that was a really good idea, and I, I would not have thought of that on my own. So um, a tribute to other people's ideas. Any any comments or questions? All right. Well, thank you, Drina. Um, I, if you want to stay up to date on the book club, which is going to, I think, going to just blossom, um, and if you want to get involved, uh, Drina's uh, contact email is on the slide that you see right in front of you. And the other thing, if you're not subscribed to WCAS uh, email newsletters, do. We try to keep everything public and a er uh, high level of transparency, and everyone's always welcome whether you're a member or not. So. I, I guess I have one more thing to say, uh, Betsy, okay. just in terms of people aren't familiar with the book club meetings that we had this past year are also all available. And uh, you may find if you're looking for that kind of activity, we had some wonderful authors. Thank you. Thanks. And of course, all the programs are on the YouTube channel. So it's all, all there. Uh, let's see. Uh, Nancy Howell, are you still listening? And would you like to talk about the, um, there she is, IBP. What, maybe you could give us the update about that fantastic program you watched last night. All right. Um, actually, I have two things I want to talk about. The Institute for Bird Populations, um, which uh, was actually brought about by another Audubon group uh, through COAC, the Council of Ohio Audubon Chapters, of which Western Cuyahoga is a member. And the uh, Institute for Bird Populations does a lot of bird banding and sponsors a lot of bird banding here in North America. But there's, you know, our, our uh, migrants go down to Central and South America and spend much of their time down there. So the Institute for Bird Populations is now working with banding stations in countries in Central and South America. Uh, a site in Nicaragua has been chosen um, called Ometepe, which is a, a volcanic island. Uh, awesome, you know, and uh, but the, the banding project uh, it had started and then lack of funding, lack of um, trained or trained uh, banders because they had moved on to other areas, but they're starting up again with funds being provided by uh, chapters in Ohio through COAC, so Western Cuyahoga. Uh, has has uh, said that they will give a certain amount, uh, several other chapters. So $3,500 is needed to uh, get this banding station up and running. Uh, they banned from November through March, which is, of course, our fall, winter, but of course, remember, the neotropical migrants are, are there, and they run into the birds that we have enjoyed in the spring and summer. So um, what is also fascinating is uh, just this past Tuesday, we actually spoke with uh, two of the people who work at the banding, who will be working at the banding site. Um, actually, they had a translator because, of course, they speak Spanish. And it was, uh, again, so nice to, and refreshing to hear that how enthusiastic they are to get this started again. Um, and, and having the sponsorship of the Audubon chapters uh, in Ohio. And you know, we not only want to help sponsor them, uh, but we also want to you know, understand their, their, their family life too. Uh, one of the participants 
that spoke uh, has a new baby, and he showed he shared the little baby's picture on the uh, on the uh, Zoom uh, site, and that that was so fun. Um, but we also know that they they do a lot of education with school groups, so it's not uh, so it's not just hey we're banding birds, boom that's it. They're teaching uh, residents and, and youngsters, again, the importance of habitat uh, and protecting the habitat. So, uh, so this is, again, really a win-win-win-win-win situation all the way around. Um, and we're hoping that once we get things, that, that they get things up and running, that Western Cuyahoga, as well as some of the other chapters in Ohio, will be able to um, have a again a Zoom session or a free conference call session. I'm not sure how it's going to work uh, with the banders there and have an update. So it, it'll be it'll be awesome. So that's one project that is moving along nicely. Uh, did, did somebody have any questions? Yeah. How how would people get to this project? Would we just go to WCAS and donate in the near market? Um, there is a tab on the WCAS website that says, I think it says IBP. Uh, yeah, if, you, if I may say, if interject, uh, if you, there are a couple ways. If you can go to the news blog uh, or just go to the home page, there's a, a navigational, uh, um, nav navigational button there. And I also posted in the chat uh, the link, the announcement and information that that button links to. Yes. Yeah. So, so that's, that's a real easy way. And yes, other um, uh, members of Western Cuyahoga have, have done some donating to that fund. So thank and you. Also in that, in that announcement, uh, informational piece about, about the IBP, there is a designated PayPal button uh, just for that fund. So that when the funds come in, they're, they're recorded and earmarked. Earmarked for that. For that Absolutely. project. So that's, mm -hmm. the, that's the place to go to donate. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. My second exciting thing is I sat in on a webinar last evening through the American Bird Conservancy, ABC, and they have got a couple of awesome projects that they are working on. Again, this is starting things up, but they're building on projects that other chapters or other groups have started. First of all, um, the, an Audubon group in California uh, has a something called ma mapping migrationis, which means they're mapping migration and they're targeting the Hispanic community. Oh, oh my gosh, I think that's fabulous because it's not only birds here, birds in Central and South America, but they're connecting the migration pattern of birds and also the social uh, of people that have migrated from Mexico or, or Honduras or whatever and come to the United States. So tying in what the birds need, what people need, it's, I mean, I was, I was floored. I'm like, oh, why didn't I think of that? So, so that one is a, a really, really fun uh, uh, thing that is coming up uh, through American Bird Conservancy. And I just sent Betsy a link or this information to uh, watch that program, this, uh, this webinar. Uh, I just sent it maybe about an hour ago, maybe not even that long ago. So, and then a second uh, program that a Audubon group in um, Wisconsin started was called Bird City America. And it's kind of modeled after a tree city um, and, and USA, maybe, you know, maybe you've seen those signs in cities, but uh, Bird City America is, um, again, having uh, bird-friendly cities. So going to your, your council person, your, 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 your council meetings, as a starting, and American Bird Conservancy has a whole list of things that need to be met to become a bird, uh, a bird city America. Uh, again, this is just beginning, just in the in the discussion fa uh, phases through through uh, American uh, Bird Conservancy, 
but again, it's building on something that has already started in, in Wisconsin and is growing uh, very, very rapidly. So I think it, it uh, so Patty, I'm, I'm looking at you, <laughs> my eyes are scanning as well, uh, that this could potentially be something now, again, whether the city of Cleveland or Berea or uh, Fairview Park or wherever you may be living, um, you know, there could be a lot of these bird cities right here in Northeast Ohio. Uh, so, and, and again, talking with maybe other Audubon chapters or other organizations like Sustainability Cleveland, uh, that this might be a good partnership uh, in the near future. Again, there are some fairly strict things that, that uh, American Bird Conservancy would like uh, these uh, Bird City Americas to follow. Um, so take a look and we'll see if uh, this could be a project not certainly not this year but in the near future thanks Nancy I remember uh, and I think Amanda was involved uh, and I think Gloria was as well after David Lindo came to visit uh, there are the various working groups that were working on to establish uh, urban birding communities uh, that that was one of the models that they seriously looked at uh, in their talks with uh, Tremont West uh, and how to um, begin to think and how to go about creating an a, uh, urban birding Cleveland community such as Tremont. It was sort of our, Tremont is our beta community. Uh, but I do remember that the working groups were working on signage and um, routes and all kinds of things um, um, based, and they had used that example as a model. That's a, you remember right. And uh, basically, uh, we thought that, you know, how do you eat an elephant? You know, one bite at a time. So we decided to uh, partner with a uh, model neighborhood. And Tremont stepped up, said yes. Um, I think I think you're leading the bird walk this Saturday, right, Nancy? That's going to take place in uh, Tremont. So we did use that Bird City America as kind of a model of things that we would like to bring out. And it was community outreach and actually uh, making birds and nature a part of what was happening in your neighborhood. Uh, so, yeah, I, I'm really excited about what you brought to us. And I think that maybe you're right. Like, for us to do it, it's, it's kind of like, whoa, what a big elephant to chew. <laughs> but if we partnered with different Audubon chapters in Northeast Ohio, it makes much more sense that we could do something like that and work together. And uh, we've been wanting to reach out to other Audubon chapters. So I, God, this is, yeah, I'm so excited. <laughs> and I'm going to shut up. <laughs> and yeah, I came, away, I came away from that webinar like, oh my gosh, I've got to, I've got to tell somebody about this stuff because it's so exciting. And if you can watch the webinar, um, Kim Kaufman also spoke, but she talked about, again, the importance of the that wet northwestern part of Ohio and the birding, you know, the birding capital in the spring and how, you know, the economic drivers of that. But these other two, again, just really uh, hit uh, the bell for, for I think, uh, uh, what we could do as a, as a chapter or with partners. That's great. It wouldn't it really the thing of it is is that we all need to be cultivating so many different um, efforts and initiatives. Uh, initiatives. So we have lots and lots of uh, emerging, emerging things going on. And if we maintain an open and welcoming philosophy, we will have lots and lots of diversity. Some things stick and some things don't, but then, as Nancy said, was pointing out, we have some of these national and global uh, organizations that are um, do doing a deep dive into some of these models and establishing 
wonderful standards and criteria that we can all look, look to to improve our own efforts. Very good. Anyone else? Um, is that it, Nancy? Is there any other questions? Or shall we move on? Yeah, that's all, that's all for me, unless, again, somebody has a question or two. All right, anyone? And I'll send Nancy's links uh, in a follow-up email to everyone. All right, then. Um, I think we lost Bruce uh, Missig. Is Bruce Missig here? All right, because he was going to lead the discussion about the Guardians of Nature mission and vision. Uh, it's draft. 8 o'clock. We lose him at 8 o'clock. Oh, Remember, okay. he has that program that he watches at 8 o'clock. Oh. We did this to him before. Oh, so, Eric. yeah, so that's probably what that is. Well, we'll have to be sure to start with his project next week. Yes, um, yes. Great. All right, then the, um, there are two things left. Uh, one, we could probably talk about uh, pretty quickly is the art auction or the Christmas in July. Uh, uh, Michelle Brocious will be uh, driving that and leading it, and she's not here because she also has a conflict on Thursdays. But um, I do know, Gloria, you know a bit about it, and anyone else who's here could talk about it. Betsy, uh, I'm still here. Oh, oh, there you are. I've been here. Oh, I can't. I don't see you on my on my roster, so I apologize. Would you like to uh, talk further about the mission and vision and take a look at that now? Well, we can look at it. Okay. All right. Um, let me pull it up. And while I am pulling it up, perhaps Nancy and Gloria, I think, could speak. I'll, I'll just tell folks a little bit about the uh, fundraising um, Christmas in July. Well, Nancy, I have a question for you about this. Um, I believe Michelle was going to put forth before the board at the board meeting which project uh, that the board would like us to focus uh, the funds towards um, for uh, the Christmas uh, in July art auction slash raffle. Did you decide on anything or did you have any instructions for us or what happened there? The, the only thing that I recall, and I have to look at her board meeting minutes, is that I suggested the uh, supporting the, the banding station in in Nicaragua um, so nobody else said any you know anything else that that pop, cropped up so um, but you know well then I think that's it I think that that's what uh, our guardian of nature's group uh, last month uh, we're leaning towards having the funds grow uh, go towards the I uh, IDP, IB, IBP project. So if the board um, offered no objections when you uh, promoted it, I, I think that's what we go with. And I think at that point, uh, our concern was, as far as the guardians, was uh, that you kind of all wanted your monies to be collected by June to get this started. Uh, when it needed to be, but um, we all thought that the fundraiser could always go back to the treasury to make it whole for what they had, uh, what do I want to say, put forth, uh, advanced, like they did, uh, like we did with the David Lindo week. Exactly, so, yes, right, right. Yeah. So we would, okay. we would put our, our funds that we... Uh, said that we would provide for the IBP uh, and then whatever comes in from the art auction or donations would then just replenish the, the uh, our treasury. treasury. Okay. That's it, Betsy. Great. Thank you. I will share my screen now and I have the Guardians of Nature Mission Vision document up, which you can see. 
And uh, Bruce, would you like to take the lead on this to um, talk about it a little bit and also enough so that the new folks um, can be uh, um, informed about it? Okay, I'm old. Can you make it a little bigger? You know, that's as big as I can make it. Um, it's at 200%. Uh, then you have to get closer to the screen. Well, either that or you can uh, enlarge your your screen viewer. Where do I do that at? Uh, let's see. Um, I don't see any icons down here to make it bigger. Down on the bottom right, there's a view icon. I don't know if that'll do it, but let's see. Thank you. Ooh. And, you know, while we're, was that Nate? Who, who said that? Chris. Chris. Chris, would you just introduce yourself a little bit for the people who don't know you here, and Nate as well, and then Bruce will be ready. Uh, sure. Uh, so my name is Chris Wolf. Um, I live in Rocky River. I joined uh, the Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society probably about a year ago, maybe a little less. Um, I retired uh, last April, and uh, so that gave me time to learn some new things and get involved in some things that I didn't have time to before when I was working full time, and this is one of the things that I chose. So I'm definitely uh, at the beginning of the uh, learning curve uh, both with respect to the organization, but also with respect to birds. Beyond the birds I see in my backyard, I'm, if you put two birds in front of me and one wasn't a uh, blue jay and one wasn't a cardinal, I'd have a tough time telling you what they were. Uh, well, welcome. And may I ask, I'm curious, what was, uh, did you have a particular professional field uh, that your skills are in, your work experience? I'm just I, work, I worked at Progressive Insurance for 32 years. Okay. All right. Well, it's so nice to see you here. Thanks. Nate, please, please introduce yourself. Uh, hello, hello, everybody. Um, I'm Nate Seagard. Uh, I kind of uh, just stumbled upon Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society um, just because I wanted to look out for something to do on my spare time. Uh, you know, birds and um, nature have kind of been in my family. I grew up in Ottawa County, um, Port Clinton area, right by the water. So, you know, birding was a very large part of that um, area. So, you know, my grandparents and some of the other things around there have swayed me. By no means am I an expert in birds, just uh, like Chris, um, but I am an advocate for nature and preserving it. So that's kind of one thing that brought me to this society. <laughs> and very I'm... Cool. I'm here to learn, and I'm here to contribute in any way I possibly can. Um, so this is a nice first meeting. Uh, thank you. Uh, Chris, tell us what about your professional life? What skills do you have, or what, what are your areas of interest in where you work, what you do? Are you asking me or Nate? Oh, I'm sorry. Nate. <laughs> oh, um. So I currently work at um, United States Ships and Company in Westlake. Uh, they manufacture drywall grid ceilings. So, you know, my, my expertise is, you know, dealing with um, manufacturing and certain things like that, uh, you know. But I'm, you know, college educated in business management through Bowling Green State University. Uh, I'm looking forward to, you know, leading projects and helping anyway, so. Um, Nate, you are the individual who mentioned to me that you like to do large events, aren't you? Um, you know, I don't have as ex much experience as I would like, but I'm always willing to step in and learn, and I do have the mindset to plan and organize. Awesome. Well, very good. Thank you. Thank All right, um, Bruce, how are you doing? Well, I changed my glasses. I can see everything. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, lead on. 
Well, last was a week, two weeks ago, me and Betsy had a nice conversation going over what we originally set forth. And my ideas and my thoughts from the beginning of this project is, is everyone doesn't like everything. Someone may like birds, someone may like water, someone may like soil, someone may like trees. And I feel it should be all inclusive because as our speaker mentioned in one of her slides about how everything is connected. And we have to learn and teach people that everything on this planet is connected in one way or another. And if we take one thing out of the equation, it can have big consequences on all the environment above it. So I want, not so much I want, this is what I would like to see, is a collaborative of people who have a dream and an idea of how they would like to make things better in life for the future generations. And the only way we can do this is by having conversations and finding out what people like and what people want to do and how they can fit in with different people working on projects because in essence it's all connected on one level or another. So it's the idea of just making a project that works for everybody. It's We're just not going to be about water. We're just not going to be about soil. We're not going to just be about plants. We're going to be about everything that this planet has. Because as I stated before, one way or another, it's all connected. And we have to take care of it. Can, like, can I, Bruce, yes. can I interject something? I think Patty Donilon's quote from John Muir that she yeah. used is a perfect uh, thing about what you're saying, about how you can't take one thing out of nature because it is all connected together. It's, it's basically saying exactly what you're expounding on. It, it's, a, it's a perfect kind of thing that I think maybe we ought to think about using somewhere. And that's all I have to say. I hope I didn't... Uh... Well, you muted yourself on the end there, so we well, don't know what I... you're I just said I hope I didn't I didn't like put a stop to what your thoughts were, but I just had to share that because I it, what you're telling me now is exactly what Patty said, and it it's just so good. That's all. No, oh, well, what Patty had to say fit in exactly with what we should be discussing what the environment movement is about. It includes everybody and everything in order for this to work. And like the old song from the 60s where he says, no, I forgot. <laughs> I really don't know what to do so I'm going to leave that up to you. So we can't have that attitude anymore of let's leave it to the next generation. It's their problem. I'm too old now. I can't do anything. Well, shall we begin on what 
the vision statement is? As written as of this moment, to be edited or changed as you feel should be added, it stands as guardians of nature here that after referred to merely as guardians seeks to attract member of the science, education, civic, government, business, religious communities, and general public to identify local issues that need to be addressed and developed solutions to consensus. In the process of improving the environment, so to maintain sustainable life for all, we seek to build bridges in our community that draw upon the talents that each one of us can bring. Guardians will operate on the following principles. Any thoughts, opinions so far? All thumbs up. We will respect local, state, and federal laws, respect for individuals and communities, scientific data, and open discourse, conversation, talk, dialogue, communication, to appraise various potential pathways to achieve our aims, and fill the niche of responding to local environmental concerns. Guardian does not seek to replace other environmental groups. However, many of these groups operate on more regional and larger scale projects and their bureaucracies are not suited to respond to the local needs. As appropriate, Guardians will form partnership with other environmental groups. Mentorship to be provided by the experienced members and outside resources as are available to the youth, thereby establishing a legacy of future generations and soliciting broad-based funding and emphasis on attracting the businesses community so the views guardians as partners and not an adversary. Background description, WCAS board as governing body, history outgrowth of the conservatory lab, face-to-face -face meetings, Guardians of Nature's naming components, UBC accelerated by COVID distancing, WCAS Guardians of Nature. And the writer of this was my friend George Mischkowski. He wrote up the mission statement. What do people think about that? Does anyone, how, how, what's your top of mind reaction? So this is, this is Chris. So I uh, appreciate the hard work by uh, you, Bruce, and your friend, George. Um, I don't understand the background description section. Um, so could you maybe explain that a little bit more and what its purpose is? Well, okay, the blast sent. It's yeah. more or less just saying that we are part of this group and this is how we came about. Um, I think. You cut yourself off. I know. Now. Boy, you love just telling me how I do that, don't you? <laughs> anyway, I think I can help. Uh, Chris with that because uh, basically Chris uh, my question was that when we discussed this last month I felt it seemed like Guardians of Nature was its own entity and basically what the Guardians of Nature is is a part of Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society and everything that we do is kind of governed by 
the overall mission and vision of W. Uh, Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society, but this kind of drills it down to what Guardians of Nature is going to use as their basis for new projects, existing projects, fundraising, all of those things that it needs to be in with that larger picture. And the Guardians of Nature was formed because of COVID-19, we were no longer able to meet once a month face-to-face as our conservation lab. We had projects, uh, the David Lindo thing that we keep talking about in November 2019 was part of that. Our native plant sales where we went to farmer markets and places to sell our plants are no longer available. So Karoo transferred that to online. It's those kinds of things. So that's now Guardians of Nature had kind of become Conservation Lab in the virtual world and probably will remain as the name when we go back to face-to-face and when we can meet, you know, not virtually but face-to-face. Okay. So basically that's the background. Great. Thank you. Um, thank you a lot. Okay, uh, well, now, Bruce, I have something that I um, thought when I read this uh, for the meeting tonight, I thought maybe we should uh, add something about the Guardians of Nature following the guidelines of the National Audubon Society uh, for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion since that is a big part of what the National Audubon Society is is working on and doing, that I thought it might be worthwhile to add it as a principle. But that's up for the whole group to decide. I'm just uh, throwing it out there. Betsy, wasn't there a whole sentence? Yes. Oh, um, where is that? It's down, down below. Oh, okay. These are, I did post the link in the chat, and you should be able to all access or to view the document. I okay. didn't go far enough. Okay. okay. There are some more um, uh, different thoughts from Bruce uh, here. You can see them here. Uh, and to um, think about the framework and, uh, and the context, and to do with the context of this group, its purpose, its mission, vision. Um, and uh, all of that. Um, we did also, when we spoke, um, talk about, I had added this, um, an example that we might follow, which is to add a set of principles, and uh, which principles and simple rules for social behavior work really well to help large groups who, with a lot of, with a common interest but diverse interests, uh, all find their way together in an, in alignment. Uh, so this, you see, the IOPEN principles. IOPEN uh, is an institute for open source economic development. But more to the point, this offers a uh, loose framework or a loose approach to how uh, this organization constructed a set of principles. So I thought you might appreciate that uh, if we were to do something similar. Uh, yes. Does anyone have any questions or any other ideas? I'm thinking that perhaps, uh, and any everyone's welcome to work on this um, together. Uh, if you would like to uh, do some more fine tuning at, at, uh, of the mission or the vision, or are you good with that part, this group? So I, I had a couple of uh, suggestions for the mission statement to make it more concise. Thank you. I can send that to uh, Bruce yeah. or to Bethany. To Bruce. I can send that to Bruce. And then mm -hmm. I think this is similar to Gloria's comments, but I also had a question in the vision statement about whether we needed to consider adding some kind of statement that 
acknowledges the link between environment or nature and social equality? That is uh, one of the things that I uh, said, but I, I can actually send this to Bruce too, but it was to provide projects that meet at the intersection of social, economic, and environmental justice. I thought that kind of uh, said kind of was an all-encompassing thought of a principle that we might want to do. So, yeah. But I'll send uh, Bruce my thoughts as well. And uh, that, that sounds good to me. Good. Anyone else? And Bruce's email is in the chat. Right. And you have the link to the document. I'll also send it out in, in follow-up communication. Amanda, you haven't said much. Do you have any comments on this? You're a good thinker as well. Uh, no, I don't think so. I like the addition about uh, the equity because I think that is a big, big, um, you know, we're finally getting that we need to be more equitable and to more inclusive and in trying to get um, greater diversity in the club. So I think that that's a really good addition. Very good. Anyone else? And Bruce, do you have anything else you would like to add or say? I'm good for the moment. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, the next point we'll go on and take a look at uh, before we wrap up. And let me just get my document up here. Uh, hang on just a moment. Sorry to keep you waiting. Um, and while I'm doing this, Gloria, did you uh, and Nancy have a chance to just tell the folks I wasn't listening uh, about Christmas in July? Yes, we did. And okay. the project that we're using is the uh, International Bird Banding Project because uh, she suggested it to the board meeting. Nobody offered an objection, and I said that Guardians of Nature already was leaning towards that last month. So we've decided that it'll be our project. Okay, um, great. Good. Um, let's see. I'm going to go back here. The, the, um, so, Nate, um, I'm thinking that maybe that Christmas in July raffle auction might be – a way where your organizational uh, and planning skills might come in because <clears throat> as as you are, uh, Michelle is a full-time key bank employee and she has said that she will head it up uh, to make sure that when people uh, <clears throat> donate or they buy raffle tickets or they put a bid on the auction that she'll kind of work with that. So. Uh, it might be interesting for you to work with uh, her and me and Nancy uh, with that Christmas in July raffle, if if you'd like to. And Nancy, I'm only I know how much you do, so I'm not saying anything other than the fact that I want you in the loop because it's your project that we're raising funds for. So, uh, but I'm just putting that out to you, Nate. I, I'm not putting you on the spot, but you may yeah. want to look at it or uh, email me, um, and I'll probably put Michelle in the email too, or you can email us both, uh, copy her on it, and then we could loop you in if you would like to do that. Yeah, okay. that sounds good. Um, I'll definitely look into it. I wrote it down here in my notes. Um, okay. And I'll, I'm just thinking it might be a way to get your feet wet. Yeah, 100%, and I appreciate it, Gloria. Um, okay. Um, I think that Betsy's putting up a document for the Guardians of Nature member, uh, the junior membership. If I'm right, nod your head, Betsy. Okay. Um, <laughs> and we've got some new people on the meeting tonight, so I'm just going to take a couple of minutes Uh to let you know that last November uh, we had the option 
to apply for what is known as the National Audubon Society, uh, Society Collaboration Grant. We, Nancy and I wrote up a proposal and we won. We got $1,000 for our project. And the project we wanted to do was to put it towards uh, a, gar a junior guardians uh, project to tie in middle schoolers and younger people into teaching them, as Bruce says, how do we all connect with nature. Um, it has morphed into now, I, at the time that Nancy and I did it, thank heavens I didn't specify how many meetings there would be a uh, week or a month so that we can start with one a month and we are still going to uh, achieve what we were asked to do. And these are the three uh, places that we have thought that we are going to do it. And <clears throat> the first one will be bird-friendly habitat in your bark backyard and around your neighborhood. So we're making it so the kids can explore their own neighborhoods or go to a park in their neighborhood and learn about, uh, like Chris said, uh, they know blue jays and they know cardinals and they can do it by sight, but maybe learn a few more familiar birds. Why we plant, this is the second part, native plant gardening for birds and wildlife and why we, like Patty was right in the wheelhouse and I see she left, which I realize this is a long time, but my feeling is that here we can do uh, a uh, native plant gardening for kids. And they, if their family, if they have a garden, they can ask their parents if they can have one row that they can plant uh, flowers for birds and bees and butterflies. And uh, <clears throat> then the third one I have named In a Nutshell. And <laughs> In a Nutshell will actually encompass uh, storytelling. We may have a storyteller that tells uh, a story to kids about a bird or a, a possum or some wildlife, a beaver, or whatever it could be. And then also it will have scavenger hunts and will give them a little list of things to look around in your backyard, see how many things you find in your backyard, and then they can go out of their backyard and in their neighborhood park with their parents or into the woods on a nature hike and find more things. Um, basically, we probably won't have them picking up. But that's basically what we're going to do. And so we launched this Junior Guardian membership in November based on the fact whether we got the funds or not, we could still do that. And we could actually give a membership to uh, younger people for $20. It would include... Uh, a series of programs that uh, would teach them about bird-friendly habitat, native gardening, and uh, in a nutshell. So that's kind of where we're at, and that this is the outline that I did. And um, the other thing um, is kind of I really want to teach the kids to reuse things, to repurpose things, and to reduce and use recycling as a last resort. So if mom and dad suggest buying Lunchables, which aren't really that nutritious, maybe as a young kid you could say, well, I would like to make my own sandwiches for lunch. And could you teach me that? So then that they're buying like peanut butter and jelly and they're doing, and so that they're not doing all the single-use plastics 
and have them start thinking in that kind of holistic way of, well, what do you take for lunch? What it, you know, and then, uh, so that's the other thing. But I thought that we could like do these objectives and just kind of morph them into what we're doing with how they, uh, what do you eat for lunch? And then you tell them that they say peanut butter jelly sandwich or soup or whatever. And then you say, well, what do you think a bird eats? And then we could go into comparing what their nutrition is with what a bird's is. And, you know, do you eat nuts? Yes. Do you eat raspberries? Do you eat blackberries? Well, then you just teach them that that's what birds eat too. So it's kind of like bringing it to a level where kids will find it fun, uh, educational, you know, and education uh, – I used to be a teacher, so education mass is, like masked as fun is the best way to learn. So that's kind of what I was thinking. So anybody who would like to help, um, please email me, and uh, I'll make sure if you don't have the junior membership outline, uh, Betsy will get it out. We'll get it out to you. And I think that probably next week, uh, week we'll probably uh, talk about this and uh, also talk about the vision uh, mission statement again uh, with what Chris is going to give uh, to Bruce. We can add some of the eye, op eye open things into that and uh, – we can add some of our own thoughts to what we think that the overall mission, vision, and what we want to do, the principles are for our Guardians of Nature group. Everybody who's been here is a part of this group. So uh, whether you can make the meetings or not, you still are, may do your feedback. So with that, it's 8.42, and I'm finish for tonight unless anybody has any questions. Thank you, Gloria. Does anyone else have anything they would like to add before we say goodbye? No. All right. Well, please look for an email follow-up, uh, which I will send out. And I would like to thank each of you so much for your time and your attention. That's invaluable. Uh, and thank you. Thank you again. Hope to see you next Thursday, and I'm really intrigued to hear uh, Tammy's story. I think it'll be uh, an, a, a remarkable one. Good night. Good night.